this is very speculative and but um, we have to find answers to uh, these elementary questions Welcome to Real Physics. Today I will talk about fundamental cosmology in the context of variable speed of light and explain why the Big Bang is better called Big Flash. Why we are talking about variable speed of light at all? Because it was Einstein's very first idea when he thought about general relativity and in fact general relativity can explain equivalently with variable speed of light. There are other videos in this series and you might watch also uh, the clip about the Hubble redshift, an alternative explanation of, uh, of the redshift. It's not uh, related to an expansion of matter, it's just uh, explained by spreading light. Um, this is precisely the, the thing uh, which is challenged here. Uh, cosmological redshift is not any longer um, related to a uh, real expansion. And uh, who invented all this stuff? It was uh, the American astrophysicist Robert Dickey who in a fantastic paper in 1957 not only corrected Einstein's original error in 1911, not only uh, drew the um, relation to Marx principle, and, but he provided also an alternative idea how to interpret the redshift and yeah that's what he said uh, uh, basically um, light from the beginning of the universe fr uh, which is emitted from very distant galaxies maintains its wavelength and since uh, all the reference wavelengths of the atoms shrink in a variable speed of light cosmology we perceive the light of distance galaxies as redshifted and this is the mechanism uh, you distinguish between propagating light at the one side and atoms at the other hand and um, if you uh, consider our almost isotropic uh, situation in a homogeneous universe with a a slowly changing, a slowly decreasing speed of light, then the light, um, the wavelength has to be conserved. On the other hand, if we explain general relativity by means of variable speed of light and we have uh, just spatial gradients and a neg negligible time change, then the uh, frequency is conserved as in classical optics. And all this, as a consequence, um, leads to this, uh, yeah, cosmology of variable scales. Just also a brief recap. You have here basically uh, the speed of light influenced by the presence of masses and of course every day we look deeper into the universe and the horizon increases and there are more masses contributing to this sum so the um, speed of light decreases. Uh, if you add the very simple assumption that the speed of light is just the expansion rate of the universe then uh, you have uh, this temporal evolution and as a consequence um, the speed of light decreases with the square root of absolute time and also since uh, c equals lambda f has always to hold the frequencies and wavelength has to decrease as well. Now um, uh, variable speed of light cosmology is, is based on a flat space with a uh, special variability and reproduces the general relativity tests and the interesting thing is that the distribution distribution of masses in the universe a very Machian idea um, determines the speed of light and then the Hubble redshift is just a consequence of decreasing c it is very much explanatory power i think and uh yeah and this model matter is in the universe is just at rest at average and light spreads, nothing else. The ex apparent expansion is due to contracting measuring scales. You might also um, speak of an illusion of uh, expansion because it's your yardsticks that contract, not the uh, matter is expanding. Now, um, 
we have this picture of a cosmology with variable scales and I uh, well, I don't go too into the details as I said it's also in the other video but it's important to understand it's a consistent picture and to be perfectly clear maybe a little example um, we live in the absolute epoch now 10 to the 52 and epoch 1 t equals 1 would be the universe uh, has just the size of an elementary particle a neutron maybe and if you consider for example the epoch 10,000 so um, the size of the universe the cosmic horizon would be one uh, hundred uh, hundred fold of the original size at the same time the speed of light has decreased to one hundred of its original value the wavelength and frequency have decreased and the time step has increased and so on and uh, yeah uh, then uh, what you observe is uh, a volume of one million times and uh, a million times uh, of the original particles and uh, this is also related to Dirac's large numbers as I explained in another video and but now the question today is maybe I have <laughs> repeated a lot of stuff here but the question today is what happens at t equals one yeah that's what we consider and uh yeah as i said the the uh you have it's it's just a logical consequence if if you go back in time um t equals one by definition is the size of the universe is just the size of uh, one proton or one neutron and um, the universe at that time is densely packed with particles okay and now what's again the explanatory power uh, in this model as opposed to the conventional cosmology um, the nuclear density has a meaning okay um, it's just a free parameter if you want in conventional physics but uh, now you understand or or y you can at least uh, make sense of why do uh, do the does the atomic nucleus have this density in another one because it's the density of this primordial state and then um, well we have this process and and uh, light uh, uh, spread at t equals one light has just arrived at the at the size of the elementary particle but then it continues to spread and uh, the more particles are visible in the horizon um, the the more uh, the particles shrink and then you observe everything what you uh, observe in the universe the redshift and the of course very low density in today's universe and uh, it's interesting because um, people who have really thought about the foundations of, of uh, the f laws of nature like Einstein uh, he was convinced that uh, something like the the density of matter of density he wrote the density of electrons but also the density of neutrons or, or protons it has a meaning okay and this is I think one of the uh, major uh, advantages of this model it has a lot of explanatory power and um, you might also uh, be reminded from this uh, uh, primeval atom theory by Lemaitre I don't think it's a very close relation but well uh, so far you have one atom at the beginning uh, you might think of that so let's uh, uh, for the moment uh, make a summary a big flash cosmology would be C determined by the mass distribution uh, the expansion rate which is simply C itself the speed of light decreases with cosmological time matter is an average at rest and just light spreads that's the only expansion that uh, that exists apparent expansion due to contracting scales and so on um, light starts to spread everywhere at infinite velocity or almost infinite velocity since the since the velocity decreases 
if there are more particles visible, of course, if there is just one particle, the velocity is very, very high or even, well, I don't like to, to speculate what means t equals zero, also t equals one is, is um, very uh, speculative. But um, it has, this big flash cosmology, cosmology has the potential to solve uh, contradictions of the Big Bang models. I will talk about this in a moment, but um, now um, let's also mention um, that uh, this uh, variable speed of light uh, cosmology is in agreement with Dirac's large numbers. And uh, it's uh, very interesting that, as I explained in this video, a Dirac's large number hypothesis might be also rephrased in another way. We have this very intriguing coincidence of the Planck's constant h almost uh, being equal to the speed of light times the mass of the proton times the radius of the proton. And if you, yeah, if you translate back this uh, at, the, at the state of the uh, initial state of the universe, then of course you can, uh, well, further uh, make some speculations about uh, which are, I think, nice, but well, uh, there are a couple of um, riddles, unsolved riddles in physics. I had other clips about this. For example, the fine structure constant uh, 137. And people like George Gamow um, related this fine structure constant or the inverse of the constant to the logarithm of the epoch, and almost um, it's in the same order of magnitude. If you take the logarithm of 10 to the uh, 10 to the 40, uh, you arrive at uh, I don't know 90 or something. And well, yeah, you might wonder: um, Is this number 137 always the same, or might it start from? one and just the evolution of the universe brought it to 137 and 137 um, is also an upper limit to the possible number of chemical elements because otherwise uh, you would uh, i mean if you have a, a a very heavy atom the electron in the first shell um, would have to would have to rotate with a higher higher velocity than the speed of light if you have a charge of the nucleus which exceeds 137 and actually the uh, periodic table finishes at uh, 92 or something that so we, we don't observe these elements which is nice because if you speculate again speculation uh, that you have this evolution of 137 then you would explain that the, the potential of the universe to generate several chemical elements has evolved um, in time now, if you uh, look at another similarly intriguing number, 136, then uh, which is the uh, mass ratio of the proton and the electron, Dirac pondered over this number also for decades. And uh, yeah, you might speculate if one huge number is related to the ev evolution of the universe. Also, this number could be related to the uh, evolution of the universe. And adding another uh, speculation, could the neutron decay time related to the epoch? Yes, because uh, if you take the square root of the absolute time I had before, 10 to the 52 would be 10 to the 26. And if you take uh, 10 to the uh, 26 times the time needed for light to pass the uh, proton radius, it's in the same order of magnitude as the half-life of the neutron. Now, uh, why this? Okay, as I said, it would be very nice that then at the beginning of the universe, at this big flash moment, just hydrogen would be possible, no other elements, because 107 has still the value of 1. And hydrogen, if 1836 is related to the universe, would be positronium, because you don't have, uh, yeah, they're just the, the, the same mass, you would not distinguish electrons and, and uh, protons anymore, just the charge. And also, neutron would have to decay immediately, so uh, it would be almost the same thing than positronium. And, uh, well, 
finally if you go back to the other formula here then you see uh, if really c uh, times the mass of the proton times the radius of the proton uh, this would be the same numbers for the for the universe mass of the universe mass of the uh, proton then you could imagine the neutron being something like a conserved big bang or big flash okay so in a way you you conserve this radius and mass of the primordial universe in a particle and then um, you could uh, argue that uh, this elementary particle is nothing but a rotating um, light wave of course with uh, one wave length uh, at the at the circumference and I think well I mean uh, I agree if you uh, if you uh, say this is very far-fetched and this is very speculative and but um, we have to find answers to uh, these elementary questions where does the fine structure constant come from and so on and I think uh, what is what is missing today is explanatory power so I I would perfectly agree it's not worked out it's not um, it's not proven but uh, there is certainly the potential of variable speed of light cosmology to address these questions and even if you don't believe that I shall remind you that well we must never stop wondering about cosmology but I shall remind you that uh, this um, variable speed cosmology uh, variable speed of light cosmology makes a lot of sense because uh, if you look at the history of cosmology you have uh, uh, the struggle uh, between the steady state model and the Big Bang model it was very popular in the 1915s and 16s and Fred Hoyle, Bondi and Thomas Gold were prominent um, um, advocates of the steady state model excellent scientists and so why has the um, Big, Bang Big Bang model won the battle against the steady st state model not because the Big Bang model was so fantastic but because I mean the evidence was uh, not any more deniable that we have an evolution okay so um, uh, the, the uh, variable speed of light cosmology is in a certain sense uh, not a bad compromise if, as you sometimes uh, observe it but it's really something that could fix the the uh, the problem which one is the better steady state or big bang that could be the solution that fits both and um, there are lots of problems with the big bang model uh, even this if it's also mainstream cosmology but it's a very nice book about the development of the cosmology and I shall also remind you that conventional cosmology has a lot of problems we have uh, the change of the Hubble constants we have the uh, debate about open and closed universe we have uh, then uh, the so-called accelerated universe which I have made another video about um, and you have now you have the Hubble tension and you have this and that and 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 uh, many postulates of conventional cosmology just do not meet the the observations uh, the dark matter crisis as Pavel Kurpa argues um, if you look at the microwave background yeah uh, many people would argue that this backs conventional cosmology but it's really uh, um, uh, an exercise in parameter fitting um, so you uh, you have a lot of free parameters which you can uh, fit to the data and it has very little genuine predictions and uh, it wouldn't be a problem maybe to to reinterpret uh, the the uh, cosmic microwave background but I think uh, we have to uh, question also uh, the data there are serious issues with the foreground removal and uh, Pierre Marie Robitaille on his um, Sky Scholar channel, I can recommend, has um, talked a lot about these uh, issues of uh, data analysis in the cosmic microwave background. But 
the thing is here, um, we have a problem in, uh, in cosmology which is not solved, which is structure formation. Basically, you cannot explain, and this holds for galaxies and it holds for planetary systems, you cannot explain how a presumably homogeneous state has transformed in something with so much structure like galaxies and, and planetary system and people are were uh, time ago uh, speculating about the fractal universe and indeed you have I have a, made a little paper about this you, you can easily verify that galaxies um, form two-dimensional structures in the universe which is very strange and all this is unexplained and it would be reasonable that there is something we do not understand in um, at the early st uh, something of the early stage of the universe and it could be that maybe a stronger gravitational constant as proposed by Dirac uh, enhanced this uh, structure formation in the early universe. Uh, yeah, this was the uh, discovery of this large-scale structure of these anomalies, Hukra and Gele in her famous paper in 1986, which is of course um, verified by later more precise observations and uh, conventional cosmology cannot explain these structures without invoking a lot of dark matter which, for which we have no independent evidence. So, um, yeah, and uh, again uh, we have the uh, riddle of two dimensions here in a little bit. This two-dimensional, um, uh, or, or I should better sh say the, the square of the number uh, is related to uh, the number of particles in the universe. So we have this two-dimensional issue related to Dirac's large numbers and Dirac's large numbers are also related to variable speed of light as you can learn from this video. Yeah, the list of cosmological problems does not stop here. We have the horizon problem, the flatness problem and all those would falsify general relativity if there wasn't inflation and ex inflation is a complete nonsensical fantasy. Uh, you might uh, like this harsh criticism by Roger Penrose and uh, yeah, not to mention uh, crazy fantasies like multiverses. That's not even science and uh, Penrose in, is right in claiming that inflation is a fashion high energy physicists visited on cosmology. Even artworks think their offspring are beautiful. Uh, by the way, all this flatness problem is also uh, can be seen as a problem of explaining the gravitational constant, which is also done by um, uh, variable speed of light. Maybe I, it, it seems that we are boasting a little bit, but uh, yeah, go to the details and look at this variable speed of light cosmology. It has really uh, a lot of explanatory power. Also, big bang nucleosynthesis is a problem. And uh, of course, all these uh, fantasies of quark gluon plasmas and and uh, what happened to the to the very first fractions of a second in the universe is nonsensical because I mean we are extrapolating our known laws of nature way beyond what we have seen in any laboratory. Okay, we just don't have these these uh, densities. And keep in mind, you need the, these huge absurd densities of the entire universe uh, concentrated in, in, the, in the volume of a pinhead or something. But uh, variable speed of light is really much more reasonable because you don't need um, densities exceeding the nuclear density. Huh? So we, we don't have to leave the realm of normal, tested, good observational physics when thinking about cosmology. And yeah. To summarize, I think uh, the standard cosmological model is not really falsifiable anymore because you can add any number of dark energy or dark matter or, or further dark substances, whatever you want, uh, to fix it. And what we need is a, yeah, maybe a change of viewpoint. And I think uh, variable speed of light cosmology would provide a good a good starting point, even if many um, things are not worked out, I admit, but uh, we should think about 
fundamental questions of cosmology from this perspective. You can find more about this in my paper in Annalen de Physique and also in this paper about variable speed of light. And of course there is also my book Einstein's Lost Key, How We Overlooked the Best Idea of the 20th Century with all the consequences also in cosmology. It's a new edition in 2022. If you like the video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and if you are interested in fundamental questions, subscribe to this channel.